It's my pleasure today to be here with Carrie Loring. Carrie is an accomplished soprano singer with Tafel Music, Baroque Orchestra, and Chamber Choir. She's the daughter of Rex Loring uh, of CBC fame and the sister of Elaine Loring, a former entertainment reporter on the Global Television Network. Her mother worked as a copywriter at CFRB Radio, but we know her as the beloved host, one of the beloved hosts from the Polka Dot Door for nearly 10 years. Is that not, is that not right, Carrie? You, you got everything exactly right. <laughs> you, uh, it's great to finally get a chance to chat with you. That is all correct. It's, it's a unique and uh, great family. I've been, I've been blessed. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about where you grew up, Carrie, and how you got involved in Canadian television. Well, I grew up in Toronto. Uh, not too interesting there. I never really traveled around too much. I'm very much a Toronto girl. Uh, but as I said, I grew up in a very musical and artistic family. Very lucky. There were people painting and people singing and people playing piano and acting and dancing and sewing and knitting and doing running an antique shop and a really, really unique family of designers and uh, broadcasters and uh, so I've really been so lucky. So I was just raised in that thinking it was normal and went through all of uh, school, always in the school plays, uh, especially in high school, always doing the school musicals and uh, finally joined a church choir which is where I learned to read music, always a great place to learn to read music and um, from there I, I, I went to University of Toronto and, and got my BA, just a very general BA in, in arts, a little bit of uh, uh, drama and music, um, and then decided I wanted to get up my nerve to actually perform for a living. But the classical side of things uh, scared me a little because I really, I just found it a little too rigid and a little too serious and I was looking for the opportunity to do something that was a, perhaps a little bit I don't know, a little bit less scary. And so I started in children's theater and I got a job with Dr. Bandoli's Learning Circus. And uh, I was there a year and traveled schools all over Ontario uh, doing everything from mime to juggling, uh, Commedia dell'arte improvisation. And uh, from there, went to work uh, with the Conserving Kingdom, which was basically Dudley the Dragon. And, uh, and then on to Waterwood Productions where I worked with um, shows such as Mouse Tales and Woody the Talking Tree and uh, shows like that. And I thought about you know, a natural progression. I was working with Dudley the Dragon and then worked with Woody the Talking Tree. I think it was only a natural progression for me to uh, next work with the Pokeroo. <laughs> so, and actually how that, how that came about is um, my sister, who was uh, she was working for Global at the time, and she had interviewed Gary Richardson, who was a former host of Polka Dot Door. He ran the Polka Dot Door live show, and she said to him, always trying to be in my corner, she said, uh, uh, "How how does my sister audition for the Polka Dot Door live show?" And he said, "Well, unfortunately, you have to be on the television show first. So she said, oh, well, too bad. And, but, but he gave her the name of Jed Mackay. And I, uh, I then phoned and said I'd like an audition, and the rest is history. <laughs> there you got the whole story. <laughs> wow. Now, you mentioned this already. You come from a family that's actively been involved in Canadian television. Did that have any influence on your decision to become a performer? Was it being surrounded? You mentioned you know, it just seemed normal to you. But did you ever look up at your dad, look up at your mom, and say, hey, I want to be in the similar type of business that they're involved in? Well, I think I did like the the idea that um, every day was a little bit different than the next. And I did grow up, my mom working at CFRB, uh, every time we would go in after school to visit her, we would meet all sorts of celebrities. And she would make sure that we would come in on the days that uh, uh, some big star was there and, uh, and we got to watch them in the studio. So I did grow up, I grew up mainly with my mom. My parents are separated, but, um, but my dad's influence was there as well uh, because we would watch him on TV, we would listen to him on World Report and um, I don't know, it just became a natural thing that I really didn't think anything of it, that we were all in the arts and I followed suit. <laughs> now, when researching your career, it's become so apparent that you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of wonderful people. And I'm curious to know, specifically from your time at TVO, who made an impact on your life and how did they do that? Specifically from TVO, um, I mean, my involvement with 
TV Ontario was mainly polka dot door, a couple of other little things, but um, I would say, I think I have to say first that because I've been so lucky along the way, I mean, I just, I think I have to say these names be just prior to, uh, to polka dot door, that I had the opportunity to work with Noel Edison of the um, Laura Festival Singers, Lydia Adams, Elmer Eisler Singers, Ivars Torrens with Tafel Music. Obviously, I've been there for years, so that was a huge influence on me. Uh, Eleanor Daly, composer. Uh, so uh, David Fallis, uh, who conducts all sorts of uh, wonderful groups. And uh, so every step of the way, I have had walked into opportunities and found unbelievable people and that's what happened to me at TV Ontario as well. I really didn't know anybody. I was so absolutely floored and thrilled to get the job and I um, came in the first day and a bunch of them were sitting around talking about the, you know, the, they were always talking about sports and I didn't come from a sports background and they were always sitting around talking about whatever game had happened the night, the night before and while we would go into makeup and but just so friendly and, and uh, welcoming and open and, and uh, made me feel right at home right from the start. So certainly Jed Mackay, huge influence for me from, uh, from TV Ontario, producer of Polka Dot Door. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to the time when you were first hired at TV Ontario. Uh, who hired you? You talked about how the job kind of came about, but bring us back to that audition. What did you have to do for it? Who was there? <laughs> Give us an idea. Well, I, I was so thrilled that I actually got an audition. I had left my name, as I said earlier, I left my name with uh, TV Ontario, and I sort of assumed I would never hear from them again. And I'm not sure who called me, but somebody called me and said, set up the audition. And I was very, very nervous. And I went in, and they gave me a stack of papers. I mean, it was a huge script, really. And in that, you had to prove yourself in various ways. Obviously, you had to speak well and comfortably in front of a camera. Uh, you had to be able to sing in key and sing with John Arpin, uh, the great, the late great John Arpin. Um, so you had to be able to sing with him. You had to be able to speak and sing a little bit in French. Um, I hadn't been expecting that, but luckily, uh, living in Canada, we we have our French. Um, so let me see. Oh, I had to move and dance a little bit. I had to. Uh, oh, and one section they had a bunch of props on a table, and they wanted you to do a little section of improvisation. So it was a really involved, uh, involved uh, audition. One of the things I specifically remember, though, that I have to say about that audition was that I left. This has never happened to me. I left that audition on a complete high, absolutely positive that I was going to get hired. I thought that is probably the best audition I've ever done in my life. I am in. But by the time I made the 15 minute drive home, I walked in my door crying and thinking to myself, I did terribly. I don't know. I embarrassed myself. I, they'll never hire me in, in a million years. I went in 15 minutes. I went, I, I you know, <laughs> walked the pendulum. <laughs> and uh, anyway, when they, when I did finally get a call, it was very funny. Um, I got a call from George Bourne, who was the um, talent coordinator at the time, and he called and he said, uh, it's George Bourne from Polka Dot Door, TV Ontario, and I was so excited, waiting for possibly good news. And he said, now, it says on your resume that you're 5'4". Are you a real 5'4", or not really so much? You know, I thought, well, what a weird question. And I said, well... I am a little under 5'4", but with my shoes on, I really am 5'4". And he said, okay, thanks. Interesting. And, hung up. and that, he hung up, and that was, that was the end. And I went, well, what does that mean? I'll be 5'7", if you want me to. I'll be 5'2". What do you want from me? And uh, anyway, thank goodness, in about a, a week later, they, they phoned to say that I had it. And the reason why they were concerned about height was because for my first year, they were pairing me with Jonathan Whitaker. Um, wonderful Canadian singer and he's very tall. I think he was, he might have even been 6'4", six, 6'3", or, six, or something anyway, a good foot taller than me and in fact it is kind of funny to watch those episodes because I'm I'm looking way up. <laughs> Carrie, <laughs> but some, I the job. <laughs> some have suggested that TV Ontario was a real pioneer in terms of leading children's education in the 1970s and the 1980s and uh, I've had a number of people that I've interviewed explain it to me and saying it was a very creative time, it was very innovative, very experimental. How would you describe the atmosphere of TVO and, and the family of people that you worked with on Polka Dot Door during those years? 
Well, TV Ontario certainly had some amazing children's shows. And um, now that my child is not so much a young child anymore, I'm not as on top of what they have to offer at this point in time. But at that time, I know from Book Mice and Join In and Polka Dot Door and Polka Dot Shorts later, today's special, um, just some amazing shows. And they, they knew how to combine entertainment with education. Right, and I think that's one of the things that I really, uh, I really enjoyed. Right, Carrie, how would you describe the atmosphere of TVO and the family of people in specific that you worked with during that time? I think using the word family is a very good choice, and uh, I didn't know that at first uh, that it was going to be a family, but uh, we were thrown together in a very particular kind of a situation. Uh, right. you were working together to try to make kids laugh, to try to teach them a little bit about music and about uh, mm -hmm. literacy and uh, and acting and some fun and um, so we're all there with a specific job to do and uh, the people in that Polka Dot Door family, they really were remarkable. The cameramen were sensitive and uh, supportive. Um, the props people were hilariously funny, as I recall, and so helpful and there to help us uh, look good. Uh, I remember one props guy in particular, anytime I ever had to say to camera, uh, I'm making a snowman out of sugar. And he used to look at me and say, lies, lies. <laughs> this wasn't true. He had made everything. I had made nothing. I had just, I just had to make it look like I had made it. Maybe I'm giving away a big secret, but I'm not an arts and crafts type person. So they had to teach me always how to make those things. Um, but the props people, the makeup people were amazing. Um, the, the, all of all of the crew, and obviously the the floor director Peter Newman was absolutely phenomenal, uh, and. Um, David Moore, the director, uh, incredible to work with, and uh, Jed Mackay, the amazing, and John Arpin, same thing. You know, one of the great greatest musicians I've ever worked with. Now, Carrie, how long were you at TVO? And aside from Polka Dot Door, you were also the voice of TVO in some respects. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, side job you did? Uh, yes, I did Polka Dot Door for, it was almost 10 years, it was 10 seasons, and I think I did it in about 9 years, because I did a double of one year, um, So and I did the Polka Dot Door specials, the two one-hour specials, and then when that ended, um, I was involved in the theme song of Polka Dot Shorts, uh, with where Pokeru speaks, it was very exciting. Pokeru didn't speak on our show, but uh, but Jed brought me in. He produced that show as well, and he brought me in to sing uh, the theme along with a group of children. And then TV Ontario asked. Uh, I not only did some of the pledge drives um, to help TV Ontario, uh, but also it was interesting. It was just for a period of time. I'm not even sure how long I did it. Maybe a year. Uh, I would go in every month and and say those little snippets of things that you would hear between shows. So I would, you know, say, coming up on Polka Dot Door, Johnny and Carrie ride a sled. I don't know. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or I would say, uh, um, you know, tonight uh, tonight on Saturday Night, night at the Movies, Elwi Yost, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I had a lot of fun doing those because I love doing voiceovers. So uh, I guess there I do follow in my dad's footsteps. That, that's awesome. I don't know if this is the official term, but the term that we've given them as archivists and historians is we call those bumpers. And, bumpers. and they're, they're often put in between shows. And with TV Ontario, it would usually be at the beginning and the end of a show because the shows weren't broken up with commercial because it was non-commercial television. But, um, exactly. And as an aside, I should say, just a strange memory came to my mind the other day that um, when I was a teenager, uh, a lot of us in those days would hitchhike to school. If you missed the streetcar, not even the bus, if you missed the streetcar, you'd hitchhike. So I was a cu with a couple of uh, my male friends, and they said, look, we're too late, we have to hitchhike. So we hitchhiked, and a fellow picked us up. And he was so lovely and so enthusiastic and asked us all about what we were into and what did we like, what were our passions and uh, dropped us off at the school, shook our hands, just said, you know, have a great life ahead of you. He was just so great. And as we hopped out, my friend said, uh, did you know that was Elwi Yost? No way. Wow. <laughs> so I hitchhiked a ride with Elwi Yost once. Anyway, I didn't know it was him, but um, always remember that. 
<laughs> and you know what? His contributions to TV Ontario can are just uh, are unbelievable. Uh, not only with Saturday Night at the Movies, but he was in the late '60s the the chairman of an organization called Meta, which was the Metropolitan Educational Television Association or something something like that. And uh, they were basically in the interest of producing educational television for Toronto. And uh, long story short, with the formation of uh, the Ontario Education Communications Authority, o OECA, which is the parent company of TVO, they kind of swallowed up and ended up hiring everybody from Meta, including Elwi Yost. Oh, and, I see. And then later in 1974, they had a contest to see who would uh, name the station. They wanted to brand the station because OECA was a bit of a mouthful. And it was Elwi's suggestion of TV Ontario that got the name that stuck. So wow, I did not know that. He was he was the man, and uh, and, and just made a wonderful contribution. It was sad to, to lose him a couple of years ago. I know. I did get a chance to meet him a few times. In fact, I think I may have even told him about the hitchhiking uh, incident because uh, I did have a couple of opportunities to meet him at the at the pledge drives. Oh, that's wonderful. So. Well, let's uh, let's let's shift gears and let's talk a little bit more in depth about Polka Dot Door. And I want to frame this next part of the interview this way. Polka Dot Door is without a doubt, Carrie, a Canadian children's institution. It's fondly remembered by hundreds of thousands all over the world. I was, I was sharing with Johnny the other day, I said, whereas myself as an educator, I may have the ability to influence hundreds, maybe thousands of kids, you guys have educated millions just by virtue of the power of television. And I, I want to know, when did you first hear about, when were you first aware of what Polka Dot Door was? And how you, you talked about going in and, and, and interviewing and putting your name uh, forth and you explained to us how you were hired. But bring us to your earliest memories after being hired, coming in and reading those scripts those first couple of days and what, what that whole uh, situation was like being the new person. Hmm, which one of those should I answer? <laughs> well, the scripts, um, I'm just trying to think, I'll sort of meander through. Uh, uh, the scripts were actually huge. And I think that's one of the things, over the years, I've had more people say to me, you mean it wasn't just made up as you went along? People actually thought that we just made it up. And it's so funny because, I mean, you're cutting to camera angles and you're singing in harmonies and you're alternating verses and you actually have a lot to do. And um, so the first thing that would happen is you would actually get courier your scripts. And they really were quite mammoth when you got your five scripts for that year and uh, maybe 60, 70 pages long. Um, and you had to memorize them. At least uh, there were always going to be cuts, so you didn't want to be so, you know, tightly woven to the script that they you couldn't be pulled apart. Um, so you would get your scripts and you would start the memorization process, and then they would call you in to do voiceover work. So you would do the voiceovers for uh, the stories from the books, and also all those uh, voiceovers from what's happening behind the polka dot door, how things are made, saxophones, uh, guitars, uh, um, and then you know all those voiceovers that we did where we showed you how things were made. So those were done and then we would start to go in and we would meet at a, a local church and uh, start the the actual rehearsal so we got to meet your partner who you were with that year and we started to read through the scripts and see if in fact they had a nice flow time things out um, uh, we would even uh, we would bring our tape recorders and meet with John Arpin run through the songs and uh, determine who was going to sing what verses what harmony so in other words we would solidify uh, our work a little bit more and then we would head home to now memorize what we had worked on. Then you finally had to prepare for the long week in the studio which were I think we had to be there around 7 in the morning and we were often not done until 7 at night. Uh, sometimes earlier but sometimes they were long days and um, on those days you would try to tape as much as you could and try to do as much as you could in one take and uh, um, it was so that was the most the most involved part was that last that last week. So it was a little scary uh, the first year. In fact, the first year when I finally saw my shows back, it was pretty funny. I was so over the top, and of course, television is intimate. And I I had done enough children's theater, and I was just so excited <laughs> and big. And and uh, I looked back and I thought, oh, so the next year it was interesting. I learned to tone it down a little bit, calm down, uh, be a little bit smaller in scope. And, uh, and each year I think I uh, learned a lot. 
was polka dot door a part of your memory, um, a part a part of your awareness, having grown up in Toronto? Did you what had you what had you known about it previous to being on it? I didn't really know a lot, actually. Uh, I certainly knew of its existence, and I would come across it periodically. And uh, mostly, it would interest me because I would go, "Oh, there's." Dennis Simpson, you know, I just saw him in a show and, you know, or whoever it was, you would recognize uh, people as you were channel switching. I didn't have kids at that time, so, um, uh, you know, so I wasn't really actively watching it, but I was certainly aware of it and I certainly knew who who was and uh, didn't know I was ever going to actually know him as a friend. Now, you, you have one teenage son. What's his, uh, what's his reaction when he finds out about his mom's former life as a, as a children's educator on, on TV? Does it, do you think he grasps how, um, how important this show is to Canadian culture and how many people it's affected? Do you think he has an idea of that? And, and what has been, uh, explain to me what his interaction with you has been as he's discovered who you were. Uh, that, that's uh, that's very nice of you to say. Uh, I'm not sure he knows sort of what a big show. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe he does. I, he's heard lots of things over the years. Um, uh, but certainly, it was fun when he was when he was small. Uh, I was able to. The show had already ended by the time my son Lee was born. Uh, but uh, I would certainly many times when I had to go and do something, I would set up the television and say, um, "Listen to mommy read a story." She's on TV, so that I can go <laughs> dinner. <laughs> so we had two carries, and uh, of course we used our real name. So and but he uh, he very, very actively watched Polka Dot Door, and he never said, "Why are you, why are you there?" I think one time when I told him that Polka Dot Door was coming on, I remember once him saying to me, "You better hurry, like you better, you better go," you know. So I remember him being concerned that. Maybe I better get to the polka dot door, but not realizing that it actually was taped. But he often got to watch, um, got to watch me on polka dot door while I was doing something else. And uh, and of course his dad, um, as I said, we're separated. But his dad did polka dot door for three years, so that was even more confusing because then he got to see uh, suddenly there's dad on the polka dot door. <laughs> And uh, of course, uh, Garth is a, a great singer and a great actor and a very, very funny guy. So he was uh, he was perfect for the show too. Who was Garth paired with when he was on Polka Dot Door? I remember you telling me that they wouldn't pair you together, but they wouldn't. And Garth, um, of course, is one of the nylons, and uh, so just you know, phenomenal singer. And uh, we were dying to work together. First of all, it would have made rehearsing a lot easier and learning our lines because we were already <laughs> together. Uh, but we already knew that we had a good blend and, and we could have uh, musically done some fantastic things and we were begging and I don't know their reasons for not doing it. But uh, So I think uh, Garth got to work with uh, Cindy Cook first off, so that was his uh, first year. Um, I think the next year was Jane Luke and uh, Catherine Bruyer, if I'm saying the name correctly. And then, But we, then we did get to work together finally in the final year of Polka Dot Door, 1993. The we did Pokeru goes to camp. The special. I have visuals, Travis. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> it's VHS. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but on Poker goes to camp, they brought uh, all the hosts together, and uh, so on that they did take advantage of the fact that both Garth and I were singers, and uh, we got to I got to wail out some real high soprano notes, and he got to jazz it up and and do some uh, uh, do some good singing too. So you know we finally did get to do a little bit together. That was a great show. That was a, that was a good one hour special. That's wonderful. Um, now. You mentioned uh, the Pokeroo Goes to Camp. The other special uh, was Pokeroo's Birthday Party, which I've recently been able to acquire a copy of that. And in that one, there were cameos. I don't know if you remember this. Cameos from previous hosts, Nani Griffin and Alex Laurier yeah. and even Gordon Thompson. Did they do something similar in the special for Pokeroo Goes to Camp? Do you remember? Uh, no, they didn't do cameos in that. Oh, gosh. I have to really think about that. They didn't do cameos in the same way. We did some other things, so the music was a little bit more produced than just uh, um, having piano. Right. We shot on location, so we actually got to, I think we shot at um, various parks, but we also shot at the island, and that was really fun because all over the island people were saying, there's Pokeroo, and they were you know, really excited about That's seeing us great. over there. Um, I'm trying to think. So we, did, we definitely did some special things, even to have all those hosts together. Um, but um, and great music for that for that show. But I, I don't 
think we had cameos on that. I think that was just for Poker's birthday. <laughs> when we spoke earlier, you had mentioned that Polka Dot Door was really in a time of transition when you first came in. And you, you've uh, come to help me understand that there's kind of these two different eras, these distinct eras, the Ted Connie Bear era and the Jed Mackay era. Give us the year that you came in and help us understand what changes were going on, when they happened, what the changes were, and uh, why you think the changes happened. Well, I guess at a certain point, once the show had been going from 1971 to roughly 84, 85, I think that... Um, you know, if they were going to continue, it had to be updated, uh, updated a little bit. So now I came in 1985. My memory is that John Arpin came, um, as I said, piano player extraordinaire. I mean, like nothing you've ever heard. And I believe he came the year before me in 1984. So he was already established for a year. He was already in there. And uh, mind you, they already had Herbie Helbig, who was also a, an amazing musician, from what I understand. Um, but in 1985, I believe it was the year that same year I came, they decided to upgrade the set, ah. and so the set no longer had, you know, the the um, the orange shag carpet and uh, the the sort of 70s colors, uh, and they updated it to these mauves and um, and pale greens and blues and uh, a mauve carpet. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure if the polka dot door got new colors, but I think that uh, the set got new colors. And, and uh, oh, and the, the playground was updated, so the brick wall was very, you know, very new looking and fresh and, and uh, clean. And, and of course, Jed Mackay came in 1985, uh, so that was a huge change um, for the show. And then he hired for, again, this is from my perspective. I, I don't don't even know if this is actually the case, but it was from my perspective that he hired. Uh, he he was really looking for good singers, and um, they'd always been. Um, there were a lot of people that were actors who could sing, but now Jed was actually hiring hiring singers who could act. Um, that's my perception. Don't know if I'm right, but uh, so the show became. There was definitely an emphasis on music. That's awesome. And of course, having John Arp in there, you just had to take advantage of having a virtuoso as a, as a music guy on staff there. He was, like, he was like nothing else. I mean, one of my memories of him, um, and it, it's so sad for me, I, I always had the dream of working with him again. Uh, mm -hmm. But you would go into your rehearsal and you would work on a song and it could be Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And he would do it in a Gilbert and Sullivan style, an operatic style, uh, country hoedown style, a calypso style. He would do every style and then Jed would say, you know, I think it would really work if we did this. And, and we just had the opportunity to, to hear him play. And, uh, and then when you would come back, we would agree on some gorgeous way of doing something. And we'd come back and he didn't know what style it was. So we had to do it all over again until he figured out, uh, well, how did we do this again? He would say, and of course, he, he didn't have music in front of him. He had a few notes, but I mean, he didn't need to look at his hands, he didn't need to look at his music, it poured out of him. And then he would say quietly, you know, Carrie, I think maybe that's a little low for you, let's bring it up. And he would, uh, <laughs> uh, he would instantly just change the key and say, you know, uh, we could just, we could just bring it up again, let's, let's, you know, so we would go up by semitones and it didn't phase him at all and there, you know, there was never one wrong note. That's awesome. That's great to that's great to work with people that are so flexible like that. Now, yeah. as as you mentioned already, Jed McKay took over Ted Connie Bear as uh, producer of Polka Dot Door. What was it like working with uh, Jed? But let me back up and actually ask. Um, some have told me, like Johnny told me, Ted was actually still part of his audition when he came in. Did you have any memories of Ted Connie Bear, and did you ever get a chance to meet him? I don't think Ted was at my audition. Um... That's a good question. I don't think he was. He came to Johnny's. Well, Johnny got special treatment. <laughs> uh, I really, I didn't get a chance to work with Ted Coney Bear at all, um, but he did come out to the set occasionally to lend his support and, uh, and thoughts. So I did get a chance to meet him, and he certainly came to a few of our rap parties. So I had the pleasure of meeting him, and he was always very complimentary and supportive. That's good. I know that he really had a lot of personal invested interest in the show, and it's wonderful to see that even after he retired, he was interested enough to, to come and check on things. He certainly did. But well, working with Jed, um, Jed's an extraordinary person and uh, just such uh, a lovely person. So he made doing that job um, uh, 
just such a pleasure, but also he was as perfectionist as, as some of us were. And so he wanted things to look right. Uh, of course, very, very musical person. So he, most of the songs we were singing, he wrote, and they were fantastic songs, which then John Arpin would um, arrange and uh, they would work together on. And uh, so he definitely brought this, this high, high caliber of musicality to the show. And I think the other thing that Jed really brought to it was he wanted it to be really very genuine and honest. And for instance, I remember once when Johnny and I were playing, just as Johnny Chase and I were playing a card game, and it was like a concentration kind of a game. And um, I remember the floor director saying, Jed's coming down. You know, they used to, those guys, those guys were out in a mobile unit somewhere, and we were on the set. So if Jed was coming down to talk to you, it meant something wasn't sitting right with him. So he would come down and he said, you know, can we make this more real? I don't want kids to think that everything works out perfectly all the time just because you're on television, because that's not how life works. So he said, I want you to, you know, make an occasional mistake or say, oh, I can't believe I forgot. Where's that other two? I, how did I forget that? Because that's what happens. And uh, so he brought this genuineness to the show. Help us understand how the show was shot, Carrie. Did you shoot in blocks of episodes, and how many at a time, and, and where were they shot? Well, as I said, the voiceovers were shot at the TVO uh, studios at Young and Eglinton, uh, but when we were there, uh, the, the set and the, the bulk of what you saw uh, was taped at Sherman Law's studios, which were down sort of Royal York, Queensway, somewhere down there little hidden away studio and uh, so we felt very separate. It was like going on a strange vacation for a week. You, you, we really did go to the polka dot door for a week. Um, family didn't see you. I hibernated. Um, it, this was very intense. Um, uh, let me see, so we would do, as I think I mentioned before, we would do five shows. They're, they're, they would do about 20 new shows a year while I was doing it and each set of hosts would do five. Um, but I was lucky enough one year to do a double set, so I got to do 10 shows one year. That was a feat in memorization, I can tell you. <laughs> and I did the, the, a lot of people got a chuckle out of the fact that I kept mixing the scripts up. So <laughs> sometimes I would, hear, I would hear papers being shuffling, sh shuffled as they were saying, where is she? <laughs> and I had actually skipped ahead to, you know, the next week's shows. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, um, in terms of, you, you explained a little bit about you know the memorization and all, and all that. Um, what were some of the other challenges, like getting these scripts? Like how often would you get them ahead of time? Like would you record in the summertime and you'd get them in the spring? But what were what were some of the other challenges of just kind of being handed a whole weeks of scripts and having to memorize them? Uh, were there times when things wouldn't go right and you'd have to revamp and revise how things were done once you actually got into a read through? Very much. I mean, that did happen. We, that's why you didn't you didn't memorize it too fully after the first rehearsals because there were often huge sections that needed to be cut or something that was working really well, like a game, like I was describing, that needed to be expanded, and therefore, um, you know, a little bit more time here, a little bit less time here. So there were definitely edits, and changes along the way. Um, and did you did you record in the summertime? I think so. I. Definitely we got, um, I think there was one year that we did a, did a fall taping, um, but I think mainly it was sort of a July, because it was warm. Yeah, but that's when most people remember, usually tape in the summer and it would air in September. And one thing I hadn't uh, talked to you about before or uh, hadn't heard mentioned is that one of the great things, and I'm not sure if this was done in the Ted Coney Bear era, it probably was, um, but it was definitely done in the Jed Mackay era, which was that we had guests. And um, there was always, we had fantastic guests. I mean, there were people everything from the zoo to, I don't know, the art gallery. Uh, but uh, Johnny, Chase, and I were lucky enough to have, um, because we were all about the music, uh, they brought in fantastic guests for us to work with. So great musicians. Wow. We had Jane Bonnet on saxophone. We had uh, Terry McKenna on lute. Um, we had Memo Acevedo, who is amazing, uh, percussionist. And that was all in the week that Johnny and I did called Music in Motion, uh, which was without a doubt my favorite, my, fa my favorite group of episodes. Wow. How many episodes did you host total? I did 50. 
plus 50. the two one-hour specials. And this would be between 1985 and 1993? That's correct. That's it. You got it. <laughs> when did you record your final episode, and did you know it was your final episode? Uh, no, I did not know that we were done. Uh, there were sort of rumors going around, but uh, I definitely did not know that that was the end of our run. Um, I could have just gone forever doing that show. It was just such a pleasure from beginning to end. And uh, so it was just that it, then in that following fall, there was sort of no mention of it, and uh, they just decided to not continue taping, and I was never told really too much about it. But we had a great run. Was there any, you know, celebration that at the end, aside from a typical rap party, like when they said it was all kind of finished, was there any kind of celebration that took place? Um, not so much. I mean, we did, we would have done our rap party and, uh, but, um, no, that's a very good question. We should have, we should have had a party. Let's, we can still do it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Round everyone up 20, 30 years later. Now, there, was there any further explanation given to you at the time, um, in terms of when you heard that they weren't going to do the show anymore? I just knew that there were being changes made at TV Ontario and uh, weren't, I wasn't really sure what those changes were, but uh, we just kept hearing rumors of things that, uh, and, and it was a shame because um, they stopped production on really what were my perception, other people's perception, were the top three um, shows that were being, top three children's shows that were being produced at that time at TVO, Join In, Polka Dot Door, and Book Mice. Wow. And they stopped production on all of them. And um, if I have that, if I have my facts right, and we were so disappointed because I mean, you know, often in the states when you have a show that's going great, that's when you keep it that's going. Right. And Open Door was at the top of its uh, viewership, um, but they had a lot of shows, so they were they knew they could go in reruns for forever. That's the thing, and you know, so many people that remember Polka Dot Door um, remember that it would just run multiple times during the day. I remember Tanya Williams, who was on in 1980, she said she would get people in the late 80s saying, hey, how are things going at the Polka Dot Door? Yeah. From, from material that she had done six or seven, eight years ago. Um, so well, I know, it's so true. I used to have people call me and say, nice hair, because you know, like in 1986, I had it permed, and then in 1991, it was straight. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nice hair. It's the power of reruns right there. Now, well, I have, Sorry, I just thought of this. One of my very favorite memories uh, of ever being recognized was of a little boy who uh, came up to me in a store. And, uh, and he said, are, are you Carrie from Polka Dot Door? And I said, yes. And he said, I hardly recognized you without your lipstick. <laughs> that was my favorite one. I always loved that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Was there any Polka Dot Door merchandising that was done during your time there? Well, I have right here. Wait a minute. Where is he? I have. I, these are my visuals. Can you see? Oh, his, there he is. His, his nose is out of joint here, but I need to fix that. But um, that's him. Oh, <laughs> And uh, I've kept him all these years. Oh, and I forgot. I heard Johnny mention about the fantastic episode that we did um, with the Pied Piper and the Rats. Yes. And I got to be the Pied Piper. Take a look at this outfit. See if you can see this. Oh my goodness. And the other thing to make Jed and Johnny laugh, I have two of the rats. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can hold them back here a little bit. They are, oh, I'm gonna do a display just so like on Polka Dot Door here. I need to, there's this long tail. And uh, here's his front, fantastic little face, and um, he is attached to this long, long wire right. that's attached to my waist, and uh, when I would move, it, it was hilarious. It just looked like they were bobbling along behind me, and uh, anyway, that was a great fun episode. <laughs> wow. Hey, you mentioned uh, a number of people already, but let's kind of see if we can list them off, even if in chronological order if you can, but who co-hosted with you? Uh, in my first year, it was Jonathan Whitaker, and uh, I also had, the next year, they put me with Johnny Chase, and the next year, Johnny Chase, and then Johnny Chase, and then Johnny <laughs> Chase. <laughs> Eventually, uh, I then did one or two years with Robert Lee, uh, back to Johnny, <laughs> and, and of course, um, 
Jim Codrington, a uh, Toronto actor who is just fantastic, and um, same with Robert Lee. These were all just, uh, I, I was so lucky, all just great performers. Uh, but Johnny and I, Johnny Chase and I had this uh, great um, uh, vocal blend. Mm -hmm. And so I think of my 10 years, I think, I guess, I guess seven were with Johnny. The six, six or seven, anyway, were with, were with Johnny. They just liked the sound of our voices, and we got, we ended up, uh, I just knew with one look of an eyebrow um, what Johnny meant. If he looked at me a certain way, I thought, oh, he doesn't know what his cue line is, so I'll just, uh, sorry, Johnny, <laughs> I'll just go ahead and take over at this point. Or, uh, But I know all just great people to work with. Do you stay in touch with any of them, Carrie? Um, well, Facebook is a marvelous thing, and uh, certainly um, Johnny Chase and uh, fairly recently uh, Jonathan Whitaker, I've been in touch with them. Uh, I've run into Cindy Cook over the years, um, uh, Garth Mossbaugh, obviously. <laughs> uh, who else? Let me see. Oh, Jim Codrington I actually have run into. Um, Jim hosted the Celebration of Life that was for John Arpin, and uh, Garth and I sang, actually Garth and I sang, we opened that memorial singing together the polka dot door. Really? Uh, so uh, that was uh, just a couple of years ago, and uh, and Jim Codrington, I believe, hosted a portion of that. So I've kept a little bit in touch, but, uh, and certainly uh, Jed McKay and I, uh, again, periodically over the years, and now uh, through Facebook. Let's do some quick word association. Oh, tell me the first things that come to mind when I say these names. David Moore. Great smile, organized, kept us on track. Uh, we would all be fussing about harmonies and you know different things, and uh, and he would get us right back on track. He was a very very good technical director. We always knew exactly where we were looking. Does that make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> Great part of the team. John Arpin. Ah, oh, just my heart throb. Uh, nobody like him. Truly one of the most extraordinary musicians I've ever met, and uh, one of the great honors of my life was to work with John Arpin. There was nobody like him. Cindy Cook. Cindy Cook, I didn't get to work with Cindy nearly enough. We got to work together on the on the special. A great giggler, uh, great personality. Um, I think in my early years I really fashioned some of my performances after what she did because she started uh, a couple of years before me. And um, when I was first analyzing the show to see, you know, what's a female host supposed to do, uh, Cindy was the one that I that I turned to and watched, and uh, she was so animated and, and fun, and so I was glad that I finally did get a chance to work with her. You know, uh, when speaking with Jed, Jed mentioned to me that Cindy was the only one that he retained from Ted Conybeare's era over to uh, over to his area. Typically, when a new producer comes in, you want to make your own mark with your own uh, your own kind of approach. But uh, he was so impressed with Cindy's performance, and she had just become such a staple. And and just like you, is very very fondly remembered from the show. Yeah, absolutely. You talked about him already, but give us a little little snippet. Johnny Chase. Johnny. <laughs> Johnny's a character, and he's mischievous, and he's very talented. And I felt like I got to the point of being able to just read his mind. And again, what I said about the vocal blend. Um, great guy. Did you sense at the time that you were being part of a huge cultural phenomenon? Like, Polka Dot Door was already established when you came into it, but did you have this sense that you were contributing to something that was going to be ingrained in the minds of so many people? Um. I think I knew, I mean, by the time I came and got involved, I, I think that I knew that it was it was already a big deal and very popular because I remember when I, you know, told people, guess what, I got the polka dot door, um, you know, people, I never had to explain to anybody what, what that was about and uh, so it was, um, I think I knew that it was that it was a big deal and uh, as I said, I'm just so honored to have done it from, for as long as I did. Do people still recognize you from the polka dot door, Carrie? Uh, they do. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Uh, certainly in the late '90s, mid '90s, that's when it happened the most. I mean, I mean, there, there was a in the very, very beginning when I first started to do shows, I was waiting to be recognized. I was positive that someone would recognize me, and nobody did. Nobody. <laughs> and then as my shows um, 
as they went into reruns and the new ones were being produced, finally I had a lot of shows on. And so there was an era where I literally couldn't go anywhere. It was great fun. Um, and now it's more you know, just once in a while. But I'm amazed how people do remember. It's often parents uh, of the kids. and uh, So, yeah, I still get it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. A um, couple of wrap-up questions here. Favorite episode of Polka Dot Door? I think you mentioned it earlier, but remind us again. What, what was your favorite episode? That's really, really hard to say, actually. Um, as I said, when I think I'd have to just choose the week that we did of Music in Motion, where we had all those fantastic guests on. And Jed worked hard to make that a week where Johnny and I got to sing, truly, we got to sing totally Gilbert and Sullivan style, um, operatic, operatic, um, operetta style, uh, as well as um, all sorts of beautiful harmonies together. And uh, Jed will probably remember the, the story of how I actually wrote harmonies to uh, a, a song that Jed had written that John had arranged uh, called Windinger. And a windinger was a mobile that would blow in the breeze. And uh, John and I ended up singing what almost looked like this beautiful, touching, romantic song. And it was all about a hanger with a bunch of wooden spoons uh, connected to it. But uh, And they actually did some shots of our faces fading in and out. And we're looking, singing this beautiful, windinger, sing a song, sing it to the breeze. And we're singing this beautiful song, and it's a bunch of wooden spoons, clankety clank. <laughs> But those were great times, and uh, I think the other thing that actually comes to my mind, this is a um, comment that I wanted to make earlier, is that sure. it was a show that um, that looked really easy, but it, it was so funny, it wasn't easy at all. You had a lot to remember, and one of my memories was we had to sing Old MacDonald. John, it was Johnny and I again. We had to sing Old MacDonald. And I remember the cameraman, cameramen looking at us thinking, why are Johnny and Carrie making so many mistakes? I, I swear we did 35 takes on this one song, unheard of. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. And you wouldn't think this is going to be hard. But between different things that John Arpin wanted, he wanted harmonies, Jed wanted uh, you know, it to have a certain flow, and uh, David wanted to make sure that you, know, you were pointing to a duck at the very moment that the camera was on the duck, and then he would alternate verses, and they, it, there were so many things to think about. And I remember thinking, oh, I couldn't believe the amount of focus it took. And about a year later, we had a guest on the show who was actually one of Polka Dot Door's prop uh, prop people. Okay. Jebet. And Jebet came on the show because she was a rock climber. So we interviewed her as a rock climber. She dropped down from the sky into our rock garden. It was a great episode. But I remember when that was over and she had taped her bit, she came to Johnny and me and she said, I have to apologize to you. And we went, why? And she said, because I had no idea all these years that it was as hard as it was. And it's true, our job was to be ourselves and be a character as well, but be ourselves, make it look easy, make it look fun. But in fact, just like any teaching job, it's tough. And you, ha and you had so much to remember at any given moment. <laughs> Carrie, do you remember the animals? Do you have any favorite memories of working with GP or Budgie or Bunny? Actually, I do have one there that was uh, that was really funny. Um, that was fun, and that added a, a touch of spontaneity to it, of course, because you do not know what animals are are going to do. And you know, I could be singing away to the little budgie, and it could start to sing. And and uh, but one time, I remember uh, working with Robert Lee, and Barney the bunny was about to hop into the the guinea pig's cage, but I was singing, and I was not. To laugh, so I was singing away about Barney is this, Barney and that, and I. But I'm aware of the fact that this huge bunny was about to jump right on top of GP, and I was trying to save the take. And Robert, he wasn't on camera at the moment, and I remember him laughing. And I thought, if I look at him, I'm going to laugh. Anyway, I then saw all these. Um, props people run forward and they were underneath like this trying to discourage the bunny from hopping over and anyway I thought I just look at the camera and saying just look at the camera I'm gonna crack I'm gonna crack and anyway but what I remember is I finally cracked so here I am singing this song about Barney is this Barney is that or whatever and I went oh, and I just started to laugh and the moment I laughed 
30 people laughed. And that's, that was my memory, was that it was so quiet, just me singing, and as soon as I laughed, the entire crew, everybody out in the mobile unit, everybody was laughing. Examples were well, Carrie, um, I'll, I'll let you know this. David Moore, the director, has provided us with a blooper reel tape. And we haven't oh, looked yeah. at it yet, but it's it's a blooper reel tape from your era on Polka Dot Door, and I'm going to now be looking for this clip, and uh, and maybe That's we can... That's too funny. Oh, I've always wanted to see that. I have never, ever seen that. Well, maybe we can look for that and find that and provide that for you. Uh, do you retain any uh, video or pictures from your time with Polka Dot Door? I know you said you had some stuff around you. Was there anything that you didn't get to show that you wanted to show? I should show quickly oh, a few things that will make you laugh. Well, there's, so I've got some of the episodes, All right. as I mentioned. Oh, then this was my favorite, the, um, the Music in Motion um, year. I have a t-shirt. I should have worn that, shouldn't I have? <laughs> Lovely t-shirt there. And would you, can, is, there a, is there a year on the bottom of that? Is it say 20 years? Uh, or something the like t-shirt had to do with one of the, um, it was the 20th anniversary, 1990. 20th anniversary, I guess, of uh, Polka Dot Door. Okay. It, 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 see, I always thought it started in 1970. Um, but I heard you say 71. But uh, And here's one you won't believe. That, oh, yeah. I, have, I have a copy of that, too. Where'd you find that? That's a record album. <laughs> and let's, let's see who's on the back. We have, let's see here. Linda We've Kemp got and Rex Hagen. Linda Kemp, Rex Hagen, Shelley Summers, Dennis Simpson, Ken John Grant, Noni Griffin, okay. and down here, Carol Ann Reynolds, and Alex Laurier. So some of the original hosts. So I was not involved in that uh, album. But wow. we always wanted to do that. And and where did, see, oh, where did got, you, Carrie, where did you find that record album? I think I bought it from wow. TVO when I was involved in the show. This is a coloring book that I provided for my son. Okay. That's that. This is, I don't know whether you can see that. This hangs on my wall. I'm getting a lot of light there at all times. may not be able to see that, but oh, if yeah. I put it up, you might be able to see Pokeroo and me. There we are. And was that taken from the uh, one of the specials? <laughs> That was the birthday special, yeah. So that was um, looking around here to see if I missed anything. No, you've saw you've saw the rats already. So, <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, what do you think was your greatest contribution to Polka Dot Door? Well, I like to think that there were two things that I uh, brought to the show. Obviously, for me, the music was a big deal. If uh, I wanted to bring harmonies, and I wanted to bring, I wanted to show kids that. You could sing in different styles. You could sing high, you could sing low, you could sing silly, you could sing serious. I really wanted to bring something musical to it. And the other thing is the humor. And I used to joke that when I would get my scripts in the mail, the first thing I would do was the humor check. I would flip through every script and see where are the points that I can make a kid laugh. Mm -hmm. And I w as soon as I would see, oh, I get to play a witch for one minute in this, and I would do everything to try to come up with goofy voices and uh, something t so that I'd know kids would laugh. Now, so Carrie, speaking of goofy voices, this is a perfect segue. Tell us a little bit about these recent squirrel YouTube <laughs> videos you've been doing. Tell us about what you're up to these days. Well, mostly, before I just say uh, I'm, I've become a squirrel whisperer, um, <laughs> mostly I'm, I'm back to my classical singing. I, I continue to sing with tapal music. Uh, um, I sing from time to time with opera, atelier, and um, tons of church jobs. Uh, there's always church jobs for singers. And uh, I sing, uh, I've been singing in the past uh, on the show, The Tudors. Uh, and you can you can YouTube that one. I sing underneath the beheading of Anne Boleyn. So I think singing for the beheading of Anne Boleyn and working with Pokeroo, I think those two things look good on a, a resume. <laughs> uh, and I sing on the Borges show. So I do, you know, a real mix of uh, film stuff and church stuff and topple music. And, uh, um, and I also like to write and sing my own music. But what you are referring to is that... Um, one day, I don't know if you can see behind me here, there's a window. Well, one day, it was in January, how can I tell the story in a very, very short way? <laughs> a squirrel basically insisted on nesting in my window between the pane of glass and uh, screen. And I started out taping this squirrel, and I brought, I don't know if you can see this little guy, hold on a second. 
This is Prickles the Porcupine. He's a little buddy of mine. Well, hey, Prickles, what's going on? Hey, how's it going, Eddie? Hey, Travis! Hi! <laughs> hey. Again. It's nice to meet you. I I heard that uh, there's a there's a new friend that you've made that lives outside on top of an air conditioner. Yes, you're talking about Stella, the squirrel. She's awesome, and uh, I I didn't want to share my home with her at first, but as time went on, she was welcome. Yay! <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, that's that's Prickles the porcupine. Well, I used Prickles. I asked Prickles to try to um, scare. There he is. I asked Prickles to try to scare the squirrel away, right. and I uh, put it up on YouTube for this, simply for my sister to be able to to see um, what we had done. And when I came back, there were a hundred views, and <laughs> so uh, people writing me to say. Uh, we need to know what's happening with Stella, and so I did episode two and three. I didn't know what I was doing because I'm not I'm new to video editing, <laughs> and it's just done on my Mac, very uh, very home studio. Uh, but as time went on, for copyright reasons, I ended up uh, writing some of my own songs for it, harmonizing, doing guitar, doing I even did bongos at one point and, and shaker eggs and everything. Anyway, I did my own music for it, and uh, these got more and more uh, complex as, in fact, we realized that Stella the Squirrel was going to give birth um, in my window. Wow. And so uh, I had her there from January to about August, and she had two litters. Uh, very few of these babies survived, wow. sadly. But um, we watched up close and personal the instincts, the care, the... Um, it was just amazing. I have a whole new respect for uh, for these wee creatures. I yeah. honestly do. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. But it was all done... Um, you know what? I have Polka Dot Door to thank. I mean, a squirrel nested in my window and gave birth to ten little pink babies. Uh, I'm going to make something of it. <laughs> now, now, Carrie, if people want to go and watch this series of movies, because I've watched some of these and they're they're rather entertaining, to be honest. <laughs> where, 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 do they search for something, or do you know the name of your YouTube channel? Where can they where can um, they find it? You can actually just go. In, I think you can just put in Squirrel Porcupine. And uh, Squirrel Porcupine Episode 1, Squirrel Porcupine Episode 2. And, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I go up to uh, uh, Episode 12. I am currently working on the final episode, uh, Episode 13, and then I won't go any further. Um, episode 13 is going to be called The Empty Nest, of course. And I'm writing a song right now called The Empty Nest. But, just like you said, David Moore had outtakes, I'm also doing an outtakes reel. Oh, there's a lot of funny things that happen uh, with a squirrel and a puppet that, along the way. <laughs> That's incredible. Well, I know there's people watching that will tune in and check that out. And uh, we've just so enjoyed speaking with you and doing a little trip down memory lane today. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. And I know we'll talk for a few minutes after, uh, after we hit record and turn things off. But many who are watching just remember you so fondly. And from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for your contribution to educational television in, uh, in Southern Ontario. You have, like I said, you have had the opportunity to influence the masses. And many people remember you fondly, Carrie. So thank you so much. Well, Travis, thank you so much uh, for saying all those kind things. It's, uh, I'd like to uh, believe that maybe some of those things are true. and uh, <laughs> But certainly I really appreciate all the work that you've done, uh, which will um, you know, help people remember uh, what we did try to do. It was a great show, and uh, I would uh, do, it in a, do it again in a second. Jet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but to say goodbye, you know how to say goodbye on Polka Dot Dora World. You have to teach me. A bientôt. See you soon. Abiento. See you soon.